So generally prior to starting up a screening business, most people will have been an employee somewhere. They will have been PAYG. They would have had an employment contract. Uh, they would have had their employer withholding tax from them. And that's, that's generally where people have been before they start getting into their own business. When people start looking at setting up their own business, there are three or four different types of structure that they can look at. And I'm just going to run through those. So quite often the first step people start take is they set up what's called a sole trader. So a sole trader is basically you go, say you're going into business for yourself. You're going to be running a business. Uh, you set up a set, an ABN, which is an Australian business number. You may or may not register for GST. Um, and this basically says to the tax office, I am an individual who is now running a business. I'm going to have business expenses, business revenue and business expenses that will go into my personal tax return. Um, I'm, I may or may not set up a different trading name. And it's very much quite often the first step people take in setting up a business because the overheads of a sole trader are quite low. Um, you still need to do the accounting for the sole trader. So you still need to do like a little PL and balance sheet so you can put that information in your tax return. But very often when people are starting up, their first step is a sole trader. Um, so uh, what else about sole trader? Uh, it's a fairly simple system. It is not a separate legal entity. So you're still trading as yourself effectively. Uh, and I'll cover a bit more on it later. But what that means is um, you're really going out in the business industry with a business name, the saying, but all of it impacts you personally. So if something was to go wrong and somebody was to sue you, for example, all your personal assets would be at risk if you were a sole trader. So People who are in business generally start up as a sole trader, but once they start getting their business moving, uh, they generally look at another structure. Uh, the main three structures are partnerships, trusts, and companies. Um, and I'll, I'll move on to those now. Uh, partnerships are basically where you and another person decide to go into business and you say, we're going to form a partnership. We're going to be partners. Um, and basically, you're not, again, you're not a separate legal entity for a partnership. So if someone was to sue the partnership, your personal assets would still be at risk. The, you're basically sharing profits in a partnership and you can set up a partnership and you can say, you know, so-and-so gets 30%, so-and-so gets 70%, so they can be set up at different rates. I generally do not recommend partnerships because the main uh, issue with partnerships is there's something called joint and severably liable, which basically means your partner can go and take a loan out and you're responsible for that loan if you're in a partnership and he's taken it out in the name of the partnership. So, you know, they could go and borrow $100,000 to make a film and if they can't repay that, then that, then, you know, whoever's lent them the money can come back after you and after you personally. So partnerships, I really don't recommend for, for, for film businesses because of the joint and several liability. Um, so I won't spend too much time on that. I'm not gonna spend any time on trusts. Uh, trusts have issues when you're applying for uh, things like the producer offset, you can't apply for them through a trust. So again, I, I generally, the costs of a trust and the complexity of a trust generally outweigh any usefulness of the, in the trust when you're looking at film production. Um, which leaves us with the company, which is, what most people end up setting up. So I generally find that there's sort of a transition from sole trader to company. Uh, and that's often a question people come in and go, when do I form a company? Uh, within the film industry, most of the time it's when people start applying for development from Screen Australia, because certain, certain funding from Screen Australia requires you to be a company. And generally, by the time you're actually applying for funding, you've got some intellectual property, uh, you're looking for investors, uh, and there's a bit of a market expectation that you will be a company. Um, so investors are going to expect to invest, deal with a company when they're investing. Um, Screen Australia will quite often expect you to be a company when they're looking at, at funding you, whether it's grants or development funding or production funding. 
and you have to be a company to apply for producers offset and the other tax incentives. Um, so very often, um, you know, you're, you're trying to figure out uh, when to become a company. Now, one of the big advantages of the company is that the company is a separate legal entity. So what that means is the assets and the liabilities of the company are separate to you as an individual. So the company is a separate legal entity. If, for example, something was to happen and the company was to get sued, your personal assets would not be at risk. So if you own a house and a car and, and whatever, if you've set up a company, people can see that company. And unless you've done something you know, quite bad, like trading while insolvent, and I'll cover a bit of that in compliance, generally the assets of the company are separate from, from you. Now that also means uh, the company has to do keep a separate set of accounts, um, keep a separate, uh, do a separate tax return. Um, and you might be an employee of the company or there might be loans going in between you and the company. And I'll cover a bit of that later as well. But one of the strengths of the company is it's a separate legal entity. So uh, the actions of that company don't normally don't come back onto you personally, which is quite a good thing when you're in business because you know, running a business involves risks. Um, if you're, well, just, I'll just cover it. If you're not producing, but if say you're running a business like a gaffer or a grip, um, one of the questions is how much income should I be earning to form a company? Uh, so like if you're earning $20,000 a year and putting it through a company, if you're earning $20,000 a year and you go, should I set up a company? My question would be, well, setting up a company actually can be quite expensive. Do the costs outweigh the benefits? But if you're coming in and you've got a business that say as a sole trader turning over two or 300,000, I'm just sort of going, why aren't you a company? And so there's, there's a sort of spot somewhere between maybe you know, 80,000 and 120,000 where you're going, okay, I've got a sole trader business that's doing quite well at what stage do I form a company? And it, it's always going to be different depending on your circumstances. Um, but uh, there is sort of a, a, a spot where you should probably be a company and there is a spot where it probably doesn't make sense to be a company and there's a big gray area in between. Um, just want to talk for a moment, the difference between production companies and special purpose vehicles. So generally, when you set up an initial company, you'll have, as a producer, you'll have a little bit of intellectual property. You'll have, have a few projects you're working on. You'll hopefully have a few, you know, you'll be looking at option agreements. Uh, you'll be, you know, trying to work on scripts, get some funding for development. And all of that will generally go in what, what people call production company. And that production company basically normally holds all the initial intellectual property in the projects, will apply for funding, um, and we'll, you'll run your business. So, you know, you'll have your rent going through and your power and your, uh, you know, and all of those business expenses going through. Um, and that's generally your production company. So, you know, you might even put some small productions through. You might put a short film through or, or pick up a small job and put that through your production company. When you get to working on larger projects uh, and uh, let's, let's say you, you got a $2 million feature film, at that stage, you're generally looking at setting up a new company, which is called a special purpose vehicle. Now, a special purpose vehicle is just another company. It isn't a special type of company. Uh, it, it, ha it is exactly the same as your production company, because a lot of people think a special purpose vehicle is something different to a normal company, and it's not. All it is, it's, it's basically a company that's set up just to do one project. So, for example, if you're doing a feature film, you'll set up a new company and that company will do, do your feature film and then it will pretty much, you'll either wrap it up or it'll go dormant or something, or, or it'll just sit there. So you normally use a special purpose vehicle for just one project. There are some advantages in doing that in that it sort of separates that project from the rest of your business. Um, investors like you to set up special purpose vehicles because that way they know they're just investing in that one project and their money isn't going off covering your other overheads and things like that. Um, lenders, if you're borrowing against the producer's offset, which we'll cover in a minute, will generally insist there to be a special purpose vehicle. Sometimes they'll insist 
insist for two companies to be set up, and I'll cover that later on. Um, but generally, it, it, you set it up, it has its own set of accounts, its own tax return, um, it runs the production, uh, and then basically at the end, you know, it'll run the post. If it's a producer's offset project, it'll apply for the producer's offset, and then it's basically it gets wrapped up or it goes dormant. So special purpose vehicle, a company just like a, produ a normal production company is just set up for a single use. So when you're setting up a company, um, there's lots of tax registrations and that need to be set up. So um, you sort of got a choice when you're setting up a company, you can come to a company like ours and, and we will set it up for you. But that can be uh, a little bit of a more expensive option. So for a lot of my you know, people who I speak to when they're starting out, they're, you can actually basically get an off the shelf company. I use e-companies, but there are several out there. So for five or $600, you can basically buy a shelf company. Um, and then you've just got to make sure that shelf company will generally have an ACN, which is an Australian company number. So any company that gets formed and they're formed through ASIC, the Australian Securities Investment Commission, will have an Australian company number. So that's the first thing a company gets. When you set up a company or, or get a shelf company, it will have an Australian company number because that's the, it gets that when the company is formed. The next thing you'll need to look at is getting an Australian business number or an ABN. Uh, you might have had an ABN as a sole trader, but our company needs to, to get an ABN. And the Australian business number is basically the, the registration it gets that you put on all your invoices. Uh, the, the, uh, the ATO will know whether you're registered for GST or not registered for GST. Uh, so, and you know, lots of government departments will require an ABN. And so you can apply for an ABN um to the tax office um and, and and that sort of thing so abn's one of the first things you can set up you will also need a tax file number so you need to go to the ATO and go hey you know i need a tax file number i'm going to be doing a, an annual tax return um if you start the company up from scratch you know I've, then you'll need to speak to the ATO about getting that or if you come through somebody like us we organize that sort of thing um, you also have the decision whether you register for GST or not. Now, that is a decision when you start out because if, you're, if you think your income is going to be under $75,000 a year, you don't have to register for GST. There are pros and cons for registering for GST. Um, the pro is if you register for GST, uh, when you pay things with GST on them, you get that money back. So if you go and pay, uh, say, an accounting bill of you know, 2,200, if you register for GST, you get the $200 back. If you're not registered for GST, you don't. So the cost is actually $200 more. The downside for being registered for GST is um, all the compliance, you've got to do either a quarter, quarterly BAS or an annual BAS. You've got, you've got to submit documents to the, to the tax office and go, this is what my income was, this is what my expenses were, I owe you money or you owe me money. You've also got to start putting GST on your invoices. So if you charge $1,000, suddenly you're charging $1,100 and you're collecting that $100 for the ATO. So uh, if, you, if your income is going to be over $75,000, you have to register. But for early businesses, some decide to register because they want to get the GST back. Some decide it's a little bit too much hassle and they wait till they get up over 75,000. The last registration you need to look at when you're setting up is PAYG, and that is whether you're going to have employees or not. So if you're going to have employees, uh, obviously you're going to be paying them wages. Um, you need to withhold tax from those and pay that to the uh, tax office as well, same way as an employee, you get tax withheld from your income, from your wages. If you're employing people, you need to withhold that those amounts and pay them to the ATO, whether it's monthly or quarterly or whatever. So when you are setting up a company, you've got to make sure you get all your tax registrations right. Uh, the ABN is a really important one. Uh, PAYG is obviously very important. The ATO gets really upset if you're not registered with PAYG and not withholding tax. Um, GST is interesting because you can actually backdate a GST registration, but you really don't want to be doing that because then your hidden issue was, well, um, if you didn't put GST on your invoices, you end up paying the GST. So you don't want to get into backdating GST. 
So they're sort of all the registrations you need to think about when you're starting up a company. 